When uh, my middle son, Ben, was around three, year, three years old, I was looking after him one day, um, just on my own, and to fill in a little bit of time, uh, I decided just to take him to McDonald's. Uh, not to have anything to eat, it was really just to, just to kill a bit of time and just let him play on the playground, because he was so small, he just wanted to, thought, oh, let, let him have a bit of a play on the playground. And we got to McDonald's and... You know, he had a little bit of a play, but didn't really want to play. And all around him were just people eat, eating. And so he would go up like a child would and go up to the table and look at what people were eating. And, and like, oh, Ben, Ben, no, 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 not, not, that's not for you. And he'd go up to another table. And I'm getting a look like, you know, who brings their kid to McDonald's and doesn't give them something to eat? Um, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm starting to feel a little bit guilty now. So I decide to actually go and get him a little bag of um, fries. And I bring him down, and, and as a good parent does, you've got to test them, right? Because they could be a bit hot. And, that, and, and so I, I grab one, and I, I put it in my mouth, and Ben's like going, ah, no. And he, and he reached out, and I'm like, mate, it's okay. Just, Daddy's just got to test it, make sure it's not too hot. Ah, he, and he starts, he starts really just get, 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 go, going cray-cray at me trying to test one of these chips. And I'm trying to convince him, no, it's in, it's in your best interest that I, that I have this. I'm just checking to make sure it doesn't burn him. But of course, he didn't understand. The first one was to make sure it didn't burn him. <laughs> the fifth one was, <laughs> was mostly to my lack of self-control. But every time I took one, Ben would let out this kind of like a squeal. Mine, Ben he would say. In other words, these are Ben's. These are mine. Get your own, Dad. And he made it harder and harder for me to take one. I don't know whether you've ever experienced it. You've got to take one and he sort of cover them as if to try to hide them from me. He was getting cranky and covering, covering them with his hands. And I'd even politely ask him, Benny, can Daddy please have a chippy? <laughs> no, Daddy, mine, Ben, was the response. Mine, Ben. <laughs> and in his way, he was, he was just saying, no, no, these, these, these belong to me. You get your own. You're old enough to get... And I'm like, oh, really, kid? Really? Like, I just bought these for you. If I wanted to, I could go up and I could buy enough French fries to absolutely bury you in them. <laughs> Don't you realize who, who gave you these? And uh, to an adult, it's ironic uh, that when a three-year-old says mine, right? Adults know that three-year-olds uh, don't earn their stuff. It's all provided for them. It's a gift from someone bigger and someone who's more loving. Never, nevertheless, a three-year-old can get extremely attached to their stuff. Aren't you glad you're not three years old and you are more mature? Aren't you glad for that? And as a way of demonstrating that maturity this morning, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind, just for a moment, just for a moment, if you would take out your wallet, your purse, your phone, your checking book, whatever you use, uh, to just to demonstrate that this is your stuff. I wonder if you could get that out and just hold it up for me right now. Just for a couple of moments. Whatever you have, just to represent your stuff, just hold it up for a moment. Would you do that for me? Just, just show it to me. Unfortunately, we get bombarded, don't we? And we get bombarded with messages all the time that teach us that we need to worship this, that our identity, our security, our well-being are a direct consequence to this. That the more we have, the better we'll live, or the better person we'll become. And therefore, when it comes to Jesus and his teaching about the kingdom, it becomes a massive trust deal, doesn't it? Where is it? Just keep it up there. I oh, know it's so heavy because you didn't, you didn't put much in the offering. All right. So as an act of trust, and as an experiment of trust today, Here's what I want you to do. I want to just hand it to the person next to you. 
but make sure they're not in your family or your spouse. And just, and just let them, just let them hold it. Just let them hold it for a second. Oh. <laughs> you can't run away with it, Pastor Abby. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take up an offering. (laughs) And I want you to give like you've always dreamed of giving. No, no, no. We're not going to do that. You can hand hand it back now. You can hand it back. That's not mine. Okay, let's be honest. Time to check in. Hands up who just didn't want to play. Yeah, you didn't want to play. You know, you, you go, we know where you're going with this, Cheney. We've, we've been here long enough. We know who you are. Um, hands up if you just got a little bit anxious handing it over. You know, I know I did. Maybe it was about the person you were giving it to. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fundamental problem, isn't it? With Christians and their stuff. That sometimes we can find it real difficult to hand over stuff to other people. And uh, so with this in mind, we're going to continue in our seed series today, and we're going to be reminded today that as God calls us to sow, He is going to provide the seed, but will we trust Him enough to sow it? If we haven't met, my name is Rob, and I'm so glad you chose this Sunday to be here with us. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun, but I do believe that God's going to speak to us today and prepare our hearts for this sowing season. And the scripture that we're going to be reading from today, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul is actually going to be speaking and giving the opportunity for believers an opportunity to, to really participate with God in sowing into God's kingdom. And uh, this is an offering that was being taken up uh, that we're going we're to read about, an offering that was being taken up on behalf of the church in Jerusalem. So Paul was writing to the Corinthians, and he was saying, look, I'm going to take up an offering for the church in Jerusalem because they're really struggling at the moment. And, um, and all the churches that Paul uh, were, was affiliated with, he would send out letters and ask them to contribute to an offering. But if you know anything about the church at Corinth, uh, they, were, they were living in a city that was really obsessed with wealth and status, and this often played out in their, in their church. You might remember in the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he was addressing the way that they would come together and have a communion meal. He was saying, look, some of you are getting drunk, some of you are going hungry. There was just such a disparity among the believers. Uh, some, were, some were slaves, some were free people. And so there was a lot going on, a great mix of people. And it obviously it was going to create some tension. Corinth was known as, an, a, a, as an, a, a city of opulence. It had a reputation for luxury. So spending money was just a common way to, that you people would use to look good and keep up their appearances. Who would think, who would have thought that that would be a thing? At the right price, you could purchase anything, any gratification you desired. They lived in a society that ingrained in them that your money, your stuff, determines your status. So that you can imagine how hard it would have been for the Apostle Paul to be able to talk to them about giving to this particular offering. The church at Corinth was vibrant, it was diverse, but it was sometimes troubled And so Paul's letters were often written as a guide to help them to keep growing in their maturity in Christ. So let's turn, we're going to turn to chapter uh, chapter 9 in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to read what instructions the Apostle Paul gives to the church. We'll pick it up from verse 6, sorry. Um, Chapter 9, verse 6. He says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, 
they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It's an amazing teaching to a church that was kind of trapped a little bit in their stuff. Uh, So I want to make a few observations. And the first observation I want to make regarding this particular passage is that God, by His grace, presents opportunities for us to sow and to give. You know, in the preceding chapter, in chapter 8, we read, and as I mentioned, that there was an offering that was taken up. And Paul mentions the Macedonian church, which was much smaller and struggling in their, in, with their own stuff. And they had their own struggles. And, and Paul was praising them because out of the very little that they had, they were the ones that gave the most. They were most generous. He's letting the Corinthians know that God had graced the Macedonian church in their ability and their ability to give. And then in the same way, encourage the Corinthian church in the grace that God has also given them. He says in verse 14, because of the surpassing grace God has given you, you'll be able to give and, that, and then that thanksgiving will occur. Grace is God's unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You, you can't earn it at all. It's actually bestowed on you because God is good. And when God graces you, what, a, a, what an absolute gift his grace is. In God's goodness, he gives opportunities for us to be involved in kingdom sowing so that we get blessed from it. We participate, we are invited into it, we participate in it, and we get blessed from it. And then God gets the glory. How good is that? In verse 12, uh, he says that the opportunity before them was supplying the needs of the Lord's people. God brings to us an awareness of somebody's need. And when he does that, he's probably tapping you on the shoulder, wanting you to do something about it. Have you ever been in that situation? You've identified someone you've heard about, you've seen, you've taken notice. Somehow you've become aware of somebody that is in need. And I believe, even just from this passage, let alone all the times that I've been prompted myself, that God does that, taps us on the shoulder because he wants us to be involved in the generous giving and the generous sowing to that need. So that's the first observation. God, by God's grace, he gives us opportunities to sow and to give. But then God supplies your seed to sow. So not only does he provide opportunities, he actually gives you what you need in order to sow and be generous. In verse 10, we're told that God who is able to supply seed to the sower will also supply and increase your store of seed. Verse 11 says, you will be enriched in every way so you can be generous. So this tells me that if God presents an opportunity for me to sow, he's already given me what I need to sow. Now, I can come up with all kinds of excuses not to sow, not to give, but this leads me to my third observation. My third observation is, you decide what you give. You get to decide how much seed you will sow. We get to determine that. You're not under law, you're under grace. Verse seven says, each of you should give what you've decided to, in your heart to give. Not reluctantly, nor under compulsion. No one's forcing you. How freeing is that? That we get blessed by God and we're not under the law that we have to but we get to. We don't have to, but we get to. So you decide what you will sow. It's up to you. But then that leads me to another observation, and that is that the more you sow, the more you will reap. The more seed you sow results in a a greater harvest. And notice this isn't just giving in order to get, but we're told in verse 8 that God is able to bless us a Abundantly. Everybody say abundantly. That's a big word. It means beyond all measure. Abundantly. Bless you. Abundantly. 
so that you can continue to abound in every good work. Paul says, remember how this principle works in verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. This is sowing generously in order that more people get blessed by your generosity. But in doing so, we're told that God will give us what we need. In verse 8, so that we will reap a harvest of righteousness. And that's a really interesting phrase. How does one reap a harvest of righteousness? And what does a harvest of righteousness look like for you? It's an interesting phrase. It's also found in Philippians. It's also found in James. And it means that we've, we've, because we have been able to sow in faith and obedience, we li- align ourselves with God. We align ourselves with God, and that's the kind of character that God's wanting to develop in each of us. He's wanting to produce that righteousness in us so that we would look more like Christ. So my last observation is this one. God loves it when we sow with the right attitude. God loves it when we sow, when it's generous. Do you want to know why? You want to know why God loves a cheerful giver? Because when we sow generously with the right motives, the right intentions, we demonstrate and live out the character, God's heart. Because because God is a cheerful giver. He himself is generous. And I think um, he wants to bless. So there's some observations, but really, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why is Paul explaining this to the Corinthians? And why has it made it into Scripture so that we all, for generations to come, would read about it? Well, I want to presuppose that there are often two mindsets when it comes to giving, when it comes to sowing. And these two mindsets can often be a real stumbling block to us. And I think the Apostle Paul knew it. Want to know what those two mindsets are? The first one is, I don't have enough. The I don't have enough mindset is a very reasonable argument that is very common when it comes to giving, when it comes to sowing, when it comes to releasing some of what you have. The argument goes something like this. If I give what I have to someone else, then I won't have enough for me. In other words, no, Daddy, mine, Ben, (laughs) or whatever your name is. When we have this mindset, we often experience fear and anxiety about um, our financial situation. Or we might constantly worry about potential short shortages or unexpected expenses, leading us to hold tightly to our resources, to what we have. When we sow sparingly because we don't want to give, um, well, we know it's because it's going to impact our financial security. And I get it, and I'm sure you get it too. And it's very understandable. But again, it's not just our money, it's our time, it's our energy, it's our faith. It doesn't just impact us financially. There's lots of ways in which we sow or which we give. So the I don't have enough mindset, Paul wants to teach us something about this. He says this in verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly. There's that word again. So that all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Just let that verse soak in for a little bit. Just reread those words again. He reminds the Corinthian church, and I believe us here at Lifeway today, that God's provision is not limited. But by trusting in God's abundance, they can confidently give knowing that God will meet their needs. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all those things that you're worried about will be taken care of by God who provides for the sparrow and you're of more value. So how much more will God take care of you, Jesus says. So that's the first mindset is the I don't have enough mindset. The second mindset, uh, I believe, is the it belongs to me mindset. And this mindset is rooted really in a strong sense of ownership and entitlement. And I get this as well. I, 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 um, I earned it, I paid for it, therefore I should choose what, to, what I do with it, right? Um, and I understand this one. You go to uni or you get trained, you go to the job interview, 
you get the job, you work long hours, you work hard, and the, the, the rewards are there for all of your efforts. I get it. People who see their resources as solely theirs, earned through their own efforts, are nearly always hesitant to share them. And once again, Paul seems to address his mindset when he says this in verse 11. Paul says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What he's saying here is that God's going to give it to you so that you can give it out. And then people are going uh, to give thanks to God. It's win-win, everybody. So God's going to give it to you so you can give it out. We're told in the Bible in Deuteronomy 8, in verses 17 and 18, that we often say this, that it's by my power and, and the strength of my hands that I've produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce that wealth. We live in this tension, don't we? This tension of, of what is mine and who is the owner and will I have enough? But Jesus says, if someone asks for your shirt, you ought to give it to them. Why? Because it's not yours. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's not like we don't want to give. It's not like we don't want to be generous. Uh, I'm sure you do. And I'm sure... I. I do most of the time, right? It's not like we don't want to support others. It's not like we don't want to sow. But until we really understand these two mindsets and understand who the owner is, we will never give away what the owner expects us to give away. Until we understand who the owner is, we will never give in the way that the owner expects us to give. So, I want to leave you with this today, that the Apostle Paul, in his appeal to the Corinthians, makes a subtle but really important distinction between seed and bread. Between seed and bread. He says this in verse 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. Seed and bread. We're told by the Apostle Paul that God gives to us seed and bread. And that's an interesting thing to note here is that both seed and, both, and, and bread are both seed. <laughs> They're just in kind of different forms, right? Uh, the distinction is important because you can't sow bread, but you can sow seed. And you can eat bread, but the metaphor really is that, is that seed is for sowing. I know you can all eat seed. Don't, let's not play that game. Oh, all your health freaks out there eating your pumpkin seeds and your chia seeds and all that. <laughs> but in this metaphor, the way Scripture tells it to us is that God will provide for your immediate needs, but He'll also provide you seed to sow. And you've got to understand this because there's a big problem when you start to eat your seed. And too many churches are filled with Christians that are just stuffing their face with bread. Bread, 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 bread. And they're eating their seed and not using their seed to sow and sow and sow. My encouragement today to us as a church is don't eat your seed. Don't eat your seed. Some of us are receiving seed and we're turning it all into bread. And here's what will happen. You'll feed yourself physically, but you'll starve yourself spiritually. You'll feed yourself physically, starve yourself spiritually, and you'll starve others physically and spiritually. Jesus reminds us to not be focused on ourselves and building up our own kingdom. But when we look after others and so under others, we store up 
treasure in heaven. Why does God love a cheerful giver? I think it tells us, or tells God, that we trust Him. I haven't always been a cheerful giver. I know that comes as a huge surprise to you. But I haven't always been a cheerful giver. Um, I remember um, one particular time um, I was visiting my late aunt, Gloria. And I had just bought these amazing Sony headphones. And they were amazing headphones and they had this really long lead. And I loved that because I could almost plug it into anything and I could walk, walk around and knock it, tank, knock it. I'd never have that happen. <laughs> I love those headphones. The drive to go and visit family was a long one and I had my new headphones on. It was fantastic. I'm not a cheerful giver. My wife, on the other hand, will give you the milk out of your cup of tea. You come to our place, you always leave with some sort of someone's possession. It's generally not any of hers, by the way. <laughs> I get to Aunt Gloria's and Aunt Gloria starts to, she's old, uh, she's, she's nearing the end of her life and she's telling us this story about how she has to turn up her TV extra loud to be able to hear it. And how the neighbours are complaining and so I get this elbow to the ribs. And Sarah leans over and says, I think you should give her your headphones. I'm like, oh, no chance. These are my headphones. I was like, no, Sarah, mine, Rob. <laughs> In the end, hey, Aunt Gloria, why don't you try these? And, and I plug them in. And Was I a cheerful giver? Not really, not really. Um, the interesting thing is that I've learned to become a cheerful giver. And one of the lessons was that um, I reckon this might have been a, a week or two weeks later, right? I, I get this package, that, this package that arrives out of the blue and it's from some radio station or something like that, that um, from a competition that I entered, I had no idea that I entered it and it was a brand new pair of noise cancelling Bose headphones. Uh, these things were like top dollar, top of the shelf, you can't get any better. Now, I can't even remember entering anything like that, I just, these turned up. I've learned to become a cheerful giver, everybody. <laughs> Why am I a cheerful giver? Well, let me just list a couple of things and you see if these resonate with you. It connects what I give to a kingdom purpose. It creates a margin in my life for God to fill. It reminds me that I am not the source of what I have. It makes an eternal difference with what I sow. It transforms whatever I give, whatever I sow, whether it's your time, talent, or treasure. It transforms whatever I give into seed. It breaks greed and self-reliance off of my heart. And in doing so, God makes me more Christ-like. I've learned to become a cheerful giver. But you know, it kind of depends on the day. You know how it is, right? But what God loves, a cheerful giver. And that's what makes me cheerful about giving, about sowing, is that God loves it. Regardless of me, regardless of the, what, I'm, what I'm sowing into, I do it because I know that God loves it. So instead of having a mindset that it's mine or I don't have enough, let's instead have a mindset instead that God makes me a steward. He gives to me what I need and he also gives me what I need to sow. He makes me a steward and stewards recognize that they're not the owners, that we are the caretakers and that's what a steward is. A steward is a caretaker or a manager of kingdom assets, of kingdom resources. 
to put some bread on our table. There's, there's some for you, but there's also some to sow as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being so generous to us that we have been blessed in so many ways. Would you allow us to be a blessing to others? Would you allow us to learn this lesson today that what we have, what we have is because you've put it in our hands. And if you've put it in our hands, you want us to make some bread, but you also want us to sow some seed. Help us to learn that when we sow, it'll always be better for us and better for your kingdom. We look for opportunities to sow through our time, through our talent and by our treasure. And may we always be generous. May we always be found to be generous and good stewards for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.